Good afternoon. I wanted to uh, jump right in today. We'll, of course, update you on the wildfires. We'll make a presentation today on where we are as it relates to our positivity rate in the state of California, where we are with ICUs and hospitalizations uh, in just a moment. But I wanted to begin up front uh, to announce a, a new partnership we're advancing, uh, to announce a new approach uh, that we are pursuing uh, in an effort to disrupt the testing market. Uh, to bring our market share uh, into that market, to bring down costs for everybody uh, and improve reliability and access for everybody in terms of getting tests and getting, more importantly, test results back in a timely manner. There's an old saw that says, you continue to do what you've done, you'll get what you've got. Uh, right now, we are facing the prospects uh, moving forward over the course of the next number of months of moving in to flu season. Time for flu season, of course, puts tremendous stress and demand for testing. Uh, people that develop flu-like symptoms uh, are going to understandably and likely request that they get tested not only uh, for flu, but also get tested uh, for COVID-19. In anticipation of some of the stress that will place on our testing system, uh, in anticipation uh, of addressing some of the existing and persistent challenges with getting timely test results, as well as providing uh, the kind of access, the quality access that provides for a lens of equity in terms of the testing, we're new, moving now in a new direction. Let me set the, well, let's, give you an overview broadly of where we are in terms of what we're currently doing in terms of tests in the state of California. Uh, we have averaged roughly 100,000 tests every day in this state. You saw a few weeks ago it was over 132,000. Uh, we've been challenged by this heat wave and by these wildfires. Uh, but let's just put that slide to test roughly 100,000 or so tests a day. The average turnaround time on the test uh, we've seen go north of 10 days, some cases 11, 12, 13 days uh, a few months ago. We're currently averaging, current average is anywhere from five up to seven day turnaround on the test. Each and every day is a precious day in terms of the test results. Once you get past a few days, uh, those test results lose their resonance, lose their meaning and significance in terms of our capacity to mitigate uh, your exposure, mitigate the spread of the disease, be able to do the kind of work that needs to be done uh, in terms of the contact tracing, the quarantine and isolation. Uh, in essence, when you're north of 10, 11, 12 days, the tests, uh, dare I say, are quite useless, but they're also quite expensive. The average cost of what we refer to as a molecular diagnostic tests. These are the PCR tests uh, that many of you are very familiar with. The average costs of those tests uh, is $150 to $200, uh, which is quite significant. Just consider the state of California has done just shy of 11 million tests. You can pull out your calculator, do the math uh, on 10.8 million tests, averaging anywhere from $150 to $200, the extraordinary cost of that diagnostic. Uh, we are now moving forward in a different direction uh, to disrupt the market by partnering with someone who's very familiar, certainly to me as someone who's had four kids, uh, the Perkin-Elmer test that many of you that have had a newborn baby are familiar with. In the state of California, we've had a partnership with Perkin-Elmer doing uh, genomic diagnostic testing uh, over 30 years. Uh, they're a partner that has proven to be effective and efficient and reliable for decades in this state. Uh, they are uh, moving and they have moved very aggressively in this space. And as a consequence of the development of the partnership that goes back years in investigation uh, of what is available in the market today by our testing task force, uh, a needs analysis that was put together over the course of the last number of months. Uh, we have formalized a partnership now with Perkin Elmer to build out a new laboratory here in the state of California with Perkin Elmer's capacity to provide the full supply chain in terms of the reagents and the roughly 20 different ingredients that go in uh, to a test. The state 
uh, will be accountable uh, for logistics and billing. Um, we have other work that we're responsible doing, but this provides us the ability to have much more stability uh, and the ability to provide more reliability uh, to people that are at risk, uh, essential workers, uh, to address the issue of the supply chain constraints that we think will only grow, not diminish, into the flu season, to provide, as we say in this slide, uh, some insurance against what we uh, lazily referred to as the twindemic of flu and COVID season uh, to provide guarantees in terms of turn around time for results uh, and ultimately to drive down the cost for everybody. This is exactly what the federal government should be doing. Uh, and had the federal government done this some time ago, you wouldn't see average cost of tests at $150 to $200, costing the taxpayers quite literally tens of billions of dollars, costing employers billions and billions of dollars, costing the health plans billions of dollars as well. We think by advancing this partnership as only California can with the scale of our purchasing power and the need to test more people in this state than any other state in this nation, that we will be able to use that market uh, scalability to drive down costs across the spectrum for employers, for plans, for our medi Medicaid system, Medi-Cal here in the state of California, and of course, Medicare uh, system that currently is reimbursing over $100 per test. California is committing to a diagnostic testing partnership uh, that will provide an additional 150,000 tests per day. So we're averaging over 100,000 tests a day. We were doing well north of 130,000 before the wildfires. We'll get back up. Uh, into that range very shortly. This is additive. It's not a substitute. All the existing testing protocols that are currently in place, all the partnerships that we have advanced with our labs up and down the sp uh, state uh, and some of these more mobile testing sites, we are uh, only looking to disrupt the costs of that system, but not the access to those tests and those diagnostics um, in the existing system. But we want to add on top of it. But what is significant in this partnership is we are uh, demanding test results back within 24 hours, the latest 48 hours, and we have provisions in the contract to guarantee that turnaround time. You get in within 48 hours, certainly within 24 hours, uh, then we have the ability to make decisions in real time that will advance our efforts to reopen our schools for in-person education, reopen our businesses in a more effective and efficient manner, in a more sustainable manner, and by the way, We'll be putting out those guidelines Friday in terms of the new strategies we are advancing as it relates to reopening based on some of the positive uh, news that we will advance here in a moment in terms of our positivity rate and in terms of our hospitalizations and ICUs. But on testing, that's foundational. If we're going to sustainably reopen, we have to have the testing capacity. We have to have the results in a much more efficient period of time allow us to make decisions on contact tracing, again, isolation, quarantine, and the like. Here's the new cost breakdown. Again, 150 to $200 was the average per test. Under this new partnership, our cost breakdown works accordingly. For up to 40,000 tests, the cost per test will be $47.99. So let's just take the lower end of the average. That's a third of the cost on the lower end of the average current costs for a test, one third. If we get our tests up to 100,000, that price drops from $49.99 uh, to $37.78. And if we reach that 150,000 uh, testing capacity, which is part of this contract, we'll get the test down to $30.78. So the goal is to get down cost of tests that are averaging $150 to $200, costing you directly and indirectly as taxpayers and as people that have gotten the diagnostic test through your employer, through your insurance, or through taxpayer subsidized insurance, up to $150 to $200 to bring those costs down to a little over $30 a test. We have new contract protections, and we went to great lengths to put these protections into this contract, which, by the way, we will be making public. It's not just one contract, contract 
This is a contract uh, for the labs. This is a contract uh, for third-party payment. Uh, these are independent contracts. All of those contracts uh, will be made public uh, and will be forthcoming. They have clawback provisions, best price guarantees. Let's just be specific about what that means. If this partnership develops an additional partnership with even the federal government to bring down costs even lower than $30.78. Our contract requires what we refer to often as favored nation status, best price guarantee. If there's new technology and we are working to advance, we've got this X prize that we're partnering with because we want to see innovation in this space, new technology to really drive down the costs uh, of diagnostics and access to testing. We want it within minutes, not just days, uh, and we recognize that's the direction we're all heading as a nation. Well, we have change in technology provisions that protect the taxpayers, protect us in this contract. Either this company provides that technology or we have the ability to opt out and partner with those that do. Uh, we have also provisions that allow us to opt out of. We advance at scale uh, the therapeutics that mitigate the spread of this disease and, and or a vaccine that ultimately presents itself as a cure to COVID-19 uh, where we can pull back. We also have upgrade capacity at zero cost for the flu package. And this is something many of us will get familiar with over the course of the next number of weeks and months uh, as we get tested for influenza A and B in these RSV and uh, this respiratory test. Basically, you can get four tests in addition with COVID, four tests in one. So we have a zero cost upgrade uh, as part of the package of partnership uh, with uh, this contractor uh, for flu season. And we also have genomics upgrades and pooled testing upgrades as well. All the areas where we're trying to push the envelope, where we see the proverbial puck going, we want to skate to it. But right now, we need to scale we need to provide some insurance. We need to bring down costs. We need to use our market muscle to do that using a more business-like approach uh, to bring down uh, the costs and time in terms of uh, the diagnostics. Uh, we have been working with our partners um, not only uh, through the testing task force, and again, let me just thank the testing task force for uh, their entrepreneurial spirit, their innovative mindset, uh, for all the work they did to scour existing providers to see what's available. And I can assure you, I uh, imagine there'll be questions, well, who else is out there? Uh, we have contacted uh, some of the most well-known brands in this nation. Uh, we have tested uh, their, well, tested their assertions uh, we kicked the proverbial tire on what they're capable of doing, but we needed more than 100,000 tests today. We needed guarantees in terms of the supply chain. We needed guarantees in terms of the turnaround on test results. Uh, and we landed on this provider because we felt this provider was the one that could deliver and uh, that has proven results, but that can deliver on what we're promoting here today. But we couldn't do what we're doing here today without additional partnerships. And I just want to thank, in particular, uh, members of the California uh, legislature, their leadership in the Senate uh, and the Assembly, the budget chairs uh, in the respected houses uh, of the legislature for their guidance, for their feedback. Uh, we went, went out and talked to a number of our legislative caucuses about what they are hearing, what they need, what they're demanding in terms of equity, response times, diagnostic um, uh, kind of diagnostics that they're looking for in terms of whether or not they wanted to move forward with PCR or antigen tests, what's the merits and demerits uh, of the same. And all of that uh, took shape over the course of the last number of weeks. But two people in particular really helped shape uh, the expectations that we're putting out and promoting here today. And that's the respective chairs of the Senate Health Committees and the Assembly Health Committee. And I want to just personally express my appreciation to Dr. Pan, Senator Pan, um, and Assemblymember Wood, uh, who's been dealing with all kinds of additional challenges, particularly these wildfires, uh, for their leadership, their stewardship, um, and their commitment uh, to this cause of improving tech, uh, testing in here in the state of California and helping support this effort. I'm very pleased that uh, both are on the line and I want to turn it over now to Senator Pan, uh, who has been very generous uh, and wants to offer some words as well. Senator? Thank you so very much, Governor. I want to thank you so much for your leadership. 
I'm Dr. Richard Pan. I'm a pediatrician, a father, and chair of the Senate Committee on Health. And as a father, right now, I have one child who has started school doing distance learning. I have another child about to start school. And in order for us to get our kids back to school, in order for us to get our businesses back open, in order for people to get back to their jobs, we need to be able to contain this pandemic. And in order to do that, we have to have reliable testing. And so, again, uh, our governor, California, is taking the lead in establishing a reliable form of testing for the people of California. And I'm really grateful to the governor uh, for his leadership in making this happen. Uh, this is going to be essential so that we are able to test people in a timely manner, get the results in time that could support our contact tracing efforts as well. Without that, we're not going to be able to contain the outbreaks, not be able to safely send our kids back to school to reopen more businesses. This is an essential step. In addition, I was uh, really pleased to know that uh, this uh, arrangement is also going to allow us to not only test for COVID, but also for flu. As we're approaching the fall, uh, flu is going to rise. The symptoms are very similar. As a doctor, I'll tell you, it's going to be hard to tell the difference, but being able to have a test that at no additional cost will be able to tell us whether someone has COVID, the flu, or both is going to be very important diagnostically as well as trying to track our epidemiology. I do have to take this occasion to urge everyone to get their flu shot. We want to prevent flu, not just try to treat it, but this testing is also going to be very important. So building our testing capacity is an essential step to us moving forward. Um, it's this, uh, this plan is something that uh, I know the governor's office has been working very intensely on and uh, pleased to be part of this announcement and where we are going to again build our capacity here in california even as other states in our country unfortunately are struggling with this here in california just like we did with the ppe as well uh, where we said you know what we need to be sure that we create a reliable source of ppe we now have to have a reliable source of testing that we can get results back in a timely manner so we can move our state forward we can protect the people of california we can ensure our essential workers are able to get tested when they need to uh, be sure our health facilities whether our nursing homes our uh, hospitals as well as other places are safe and our schools are safe this is so essential and again i want to thank the governor for his leadership in making this happen and certainly as a physician and a father and chair of the health committee in the senate i'm very strongly in support of uh, this uh, proposal thank you thank you senator thank you for um, all of your hard work, thank you for your support, and thank you for more importantly your leadership in this space. Uh, also, uh, in reminding people of the essential nature uh, where it is appropriate uh, to get the uh, influenza shot, to get the immunization as we move into the flu season. That's an important reminder. Uh, also, pleased uh, to have uh, Assemblymember Member Wood, who also happens to be Dr. Dr. Wood, uh, who also chairs a critical committee in the Assembly, uh, who also has been advising uh, and supporting uh, our broader efforts in this space uh, and has been very impactful in getting us to this point. Uh, Dr. Wood. Thank you so much, Governor Newsom. And this is a thank you so much for your efforts. Also, Dr. Ghali, I know, has been working hard, as so many have in the background. I guess uh, you could use the phrase uh, game changer, and, and we use that a lot, but I really mean it. This is a game changer for us, the ability to be able to test a, potentially 150,000 more a day and get those results back really quickly um, will, will really impact people's quality of life. I think of uh, certainly as we approach flu season, uh, the challenges where it seems like in flu season and cold season, everybody's coughing. Uh, to be able to know uh, right up front in a short amount of time who is infected and who is not will be important. As we look, uh, certainly right now, and one of my concerns has been uh, fires in my district uh, and the concerns about our frontline uh, firefighters, uh, law enforcement, and all the com uh, county uh, uh, EMS people that are out there, um, these, the ability to have increased testing capacity is absolutely critical. So. Uh, this is a big day um, to be able to use California's uh, amazing uh, market power and strength. Um, it's, I'm proud to be a Californian today, and I can't thank you enough for your efforts, Governor Newsom. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Assembly Member. Thank you, both of you, Senator Assembly Member. Thank you for everything you're doing. And again, uh, special thanks to 
Dr. Wood and everything he's up against as it relates to the LNU wildfire, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment, uh, disproportionately impacting uh, his district here in the state of California. But again, thank you uh, both for um, you know forcing us to raise our standards and forcing us to raise uh, the expectation in terms of what we can deliver and allowing us to, to flex uh, our market muscle at scale. And I appreciate, uh, Dr. Pan, your reference on PPE as well. It should be noted uh, as it relates to the wildfires, just in the last uh, week we've been able to distribute uh, some 1.3 million N95 masks uh, to our ag commissioners all up and down the state of California as it relates to impacts uh, and air quality associated with these wildfires. Uh, we would not have been in that position had we not secured hundreds of millions uh, of procedure masks, uh, surgical masks, and N95 masks, over 300 million uh, in inventory, millions that are being distributed every single week. So I appreciate in the spirit uh, of that effort and the spirit of scale and scope uh, of a state as large as ours uh, that uh, we're bringing that spirit into this effort. Uh, and again, we just thank you both for your leadership in that space. Uh, with that, let me transition. Uh, Dr. Galley, thank you as well. well. Of course, he'll be available for questions specific to this contract, but I cannot uh, impress upon you more how proud we are. And I thank you, Dr. Wood, for that reference, Dr. Galley's efforts in this space, working with the newly constituted testing task force to, to push the envelope here, demand more, and prepare uh, for the next uh, eight to ten weeks to build this capacity so we can get these uh, contract in effect uh, and start seeing the benefit of this effort. So again, within the next eight to ten weeks, uh, we should see the fruits of this effort as we build out the lab space, as we work to get the logistics work done, uh, and uh, we uh, meet all of the provisions set forth in the contract. Uh, speaking of setting forth, uh, we are putting every single asset we possibly can, point every conceivable resource to battle uh, these historic wildfires. Historic because we've already crossed the threshold uh, already this year in terms of acreage burned uh, that puts us uh, not on pace to have an historic wildfire season, but actually sets the pace for an historic wildfire season. We have over now 15,000 firefighters uh, working the lines, hand crews, uh, dozers, fire engines, traditional engines, every conceivable uh, asset uh, that we have pushing the boundaries uh, in terms of the state resources and the mutual aid system as well as the benefits uh, we've had from as far away as Kansas and Montana to the incredible support we're getting from Washington State, uh, Oregon, among many other states. And we're grateful again to leadership in those states for assembling those assets and providing them in a timely manner to supplement our firefighting resources. Here's why. 700 fires now across the state uh, since the beginning of this latest uh, round fires that now has taken 1.3 million acres that have been burned. Just the last 24 hours, to put things in perspective, uh, we've had 423 uh, lightning strikes, primarily dry lightning strikes, not in every instance, but primarily 50 new fires overnight. By the way, um, as of an hour or so ago, they have been effectively suppressed uh, all 50 of those new fires, but it gives you a sense of the magnitude and scope of what uh, these incredible uh, leaders, these incredible frontline heroes are doing every single day, not only to address uh, what is top of mind in our consciousness, these two dozen large-scale wildfires, but trying to mitigate the impact and spread of all these new fires uh, that are lighting up uh, on almost seemingly an hourly basis now here in the state. Tragically, we've lost seven individuals. Uh, the good news that we have not found, and again, these numbers, um, they're sobering because uh, you only know what you know. You don't know what you don't know as we get back in. And once the fires are suppressed and we get back in and we start seeing repopulation, uh, we're likely to discover additional fatalities. But seven uh, to date, uh, we have identified and this goes for structures as well, identified just shy of 1,700 structures that have been destroyed. Uh, we anticipate that number to go uh, substantially in the coming days and coming weeks. Let's talk about what we did a few days ago, and that's uh, the update that I provided on Monday. 
uh, few days, Wednesday, uh, we want to update you on where we are in containment and total number of acreage burned. As you recall, the LNU fire, the Lake Napa uh, complex of lightning uh, that occurred, this complex of fires, uh, has on Monday uh, was 22 percent contained, impacted 350 acres, 1,000 acres, that is. Today, uh, we've made real progress over a 48-hour period from 22 percent containment to 33 percent containment uh, and kept the acreage relatively intact, 350,000 acres to about 357,000. CZU fire, uh, which has generated a lot of stress for no other reason uh, than in recorded history, we've never seen a fire this size and scope in this region of the state. Um, and this is, uh, I get another testament, demonstrable example uh, of, uh, of the reality, uh, not just the assertion, uh, not just the point of view, the reality of climate change uh, in this state and its impact in this state. On Monday, the CZU um, in that Santa Cruz area, 13 percent contained, 78,000 acres, kept it under 80,000 acres, making a little more progress on containment, 19 percent. So uh, encouraging LNU, uh, CSU, moving in the right direction, again, over a 48-hour period. The SCU, again, LNU and SCU represent the second and third largest fires in California's history, at least modern recorded history. Monday, 10 percent contained, 347,000 acres. Today, more than doubled the containment, 25 percent, uh, and kept it relatively um, uh, concentrated to uh, 365,000 uh, acres. I had the privilege of flying over um, that, um, that fire a couple of days back, uh, seeing flames as high as 10 stories, 100 feet, uh, an extraordinary complex that came together, uh, one larger fire, uh, incredible work being done. You really get a sense of that uh, when you're flying over these fires, these dozer crews, the hand crews, the incredible work people are doing uh, to prepare, including the fire drops, those red lines you see next to those dozer lines, and uh, the incredible tactics that are display, uh, dis, uh, dis, well, displayed and deployed uh, in these wildfires. Best in class, CAL FIRE, best in class our mutual aid system. Uh, you don't think it, you get to know it uh, when you see it up close, including some of the CDCR teams that were out there doing incredible work as well. August fire generated some interest, 11 percent contained on Monday, 178,000 acre, must, mostly brush and grass, uh, remains uh, a concern, but acreage has grown about 197,000, but we're getting up to 17 percent containment, so progress. Progress, though, really needs to be highlighted here, this mock fire. This is in around Hachechi. Could have impacted the, um, well, entire Hachechi system, uh, which is that 167-mile gravity-fed system um, that actually feeds the water and a lot of the power for the city and county of San Francisco and the region as it relates to the Public Utilities Commission that manages uh, that region uh, through their work. Uh, there was real concern around this fire. Just 2,800 acres on Monday. Uh, the containment over the weekend, we got to 20 percent, but real concern about the impact that this could just go. Uh, and I'll tell you, if you want a good news story, if someone actually wants to write a good news story, uh, learn about the heroism of the firefight uh, and the firefighters there. 60 percent contained in over 48-hour period, and they kept it at 2,800. What, you know, it's an old adage in, in politics broadly defined, uh, unlike baseball, you don't get credit for saves. Uh, let's hope that uh, these firefighters get some credit for what they were able to produce uh, at this fire. Um, we've been talking a lot about it privately, and I just thought it was important to share that publicly. Um, great work of CAL FIRE, great work of our mutual aid system, demonstrably exampled in the mock fire. Uh, the sheep fire, also concern. Uh, this one has been stubborn, 0 percent containment, 26,000 acres. We're at 3 percent. It's grown modestly, uh, but I highlight it because I may need to continue to highlight this over the course of the next uh, number of days. And one other fire I wanted to highlight uh, that was previously referred to as the Castle Fire, now the SQF Fire. I know these are all hard to, uh, to manage and to monitor, uh, but we are managing to monitor all of them and wanted to socialize this more publicly with you. Uh, Zero percent contained on Monday, 5,000 acres. It's grown, tripled in size, about 18,000 acres. Still zero percent contained as we pull 
uh, more resources from Southern California and the Lake Fire and those other fires and continue to make progress on these other uh, complexes, we will be able to pull even more resources uh, to help, and you'll see those containment numbers go up. But important fire to highlight or complex, uh, and uh, I want to just again um, note that uh, we are doing everything we can to get on top of that. Currently, uh, we have just shy of 4,000 people have been evacuated in shelters statewide. Uh, part of our emphasis and push in the COVID environment is to get people uh, in non-congregate settings. And, and I want to just to highlight this uh, briefly. Uh, of the roughly 4,000 evacuees, uh, we now have the vast majority of them, 3,041 people out of 3,889 uh, in hotel rooms. Uh, so they can cohort in a way uh, where they're not mixing in these congregate uh, facilities and settings, all part and parcel of the protocols we put in place for not only um, for not only evacuees, but we had done for homeless individuals and those that were testing positive or coming into contact with people that tested positive that needed to isolate uh, as part of our previous pandemic efforts. They're paying dividends as well in terms of our evacuation efforts. 14 shelters now, fully operational, about 848 people uh, in these congregate shelters. So you're seeing a decline in the total population in the congregate. You're seeing an increase in the non-congregate, the hotel rooms, which is encouraging, particularly, again, from a health and safety perspective in a COVID environment. Here's where we are in terms of the environment, like mitigation and the spread of COVID-19 transmission rates based upon uh, tests. Uh, we had a, t a tougher testing number that came in yesterday, a little over 70,000. It brought down our total average test. Again, uh, you can uh, chalk that directly to the impact uh, some of our testing sites. I think I mentioned Monday uh, about 11 uh, sites, at least over the weekend, were down. We're updating those numbers, those Verily and OptumServe sites because of the heat wave and uh, the smoke issues as well as the fire danger and the evacuations. Uh, so that's impacted our total number of tests. Uh, but we nonetheless are still seeing, uh, despite case numbers of 6,004, we're seeing a seven-day average uh, continue to decline in a favorable way. You can see that exampled here, not just as a seven-day average, which is 5.8 percent, which is our positivity rate, over seven day period, but this is the positivity rate over 14 day period, a slide many of you uh, are familiar with. So the positivity rate dropping 6.5, 6.4, uh, we're seeing that 14 day now decline 6.1, again 5.8 on the seven day. Hospitalizations continuing to trend in a very positive direction, 17 percent decrease over the last 14 days. Uh, you're seeing the same things, about 18 percent. Uh, on ICU admissions. We're now down about 16 percent of our total uh, COVID positive patients in ICUs in terms of our ICU capacity. It's dropped from 23 percent down to 16 percent. Uh, but again, hospitalizations, ICUs, tracking uh, in an encouraging and favorable direction. Not surprisingly, based upon all of this, um, the county monitoring list, which again, is a dynamic list. People come on, people come off. You see these numbers change on a consistent basis. Uh, you see 34 counties now, not the 35. Here are the ones that were removed, Amador and Glen. Uh, we added to Hama County uh, to the list. Uh, I'll remind you as we close on Friday, we'll be putting out uh, the new sectoral guidelines, our new framework uh, based upon experiences, best practices, um, and uh, expressed concerns and input uh, that we've received over the course of the last many weeks and months, uh, particularly over the last many days as we're working with local health officials on uh, augmenting and addressing uh, their concerns, augmenting those guidelines based upon uh, those concerns addressed or insight uh, that they're providing. Uh, and so Friday, expect that list, expect some other announcements on Friday. But we, uh, again, today really wanted to highlight uh, what is a predicate for any sustainable reopening, safely reopen in a sustainable way. We have to improve the testing protocols. Can't happen soon enough. Again, eight to 10 weeks to get that uh, moving and operationalized. It's additive. We're not taking away anything that already exists. It'll be additive to those efforts, but it will allow us more flexibility, again, more reliability, and I believe will have an impact not just on the state in terms of driving down costs to test, but I hope 
uh, can enliven people across this country to get down the cost of this test. If you uh, are fiscally conservative, uh, then you should be demanding the federal government uh, use its marketing power to drive down the cost of tests. In the state of California, we are doing our part, and we're hoping this can inspire others to do the same. And we hope to leverage these efforts, and we're also working outside the state potentially to include other states uh, in these broader protocols and efforts um, if, uh, indeed, uh, that avails itself in terms of the success of this new partnership that we have formed. Uh, always, and forgive me, but as I say, repetition is the mother of skill. Uh, wear a mask, please. Uh, physically distance uh, where you can uh, continue to practice the kind of hygiene uh, that you all know from your early years when your mother and grandmother uh, uh, were admonishing you for not washing your hands. Uh, that will protect you not only from spread of this virus or uh, mitigate the spread, but also impact the upcoming flu season in a meaningful way. Uh, and you'll see on Friday um, on the issue of minimizing mixing, we've got some new PSAs we'll be putting out uh, around the issue of mixing uh, and where we're seeing uh, challenges. Uh, and so I cannot impress upon you more, though I will on Friday, uh, the importance of doing what you can to minimize mixing um, when you're outside of your cohort and outside of your household, uh, critical in terms of mitigating the spread. So that's the overview for today. A lot. Uh, to share on wildfires, on the COVID updated numbers, uh, previewing what we'll put out Friday, uh, continuing uh, to work um, very close on evictions uh, with the legislature, uh, working with the legislature to get through this last week of uh, this legislative session. Uh, a lot of moving parts, uh, but progress uh, in many of these areas, and again, partnerships uh, that uh, are proving effective. And again, I cannot be more grateful uh, for the Senator and the Assembly member for joining us here today uh, in advancing that cause of partnership as well. With that, happy to take any questions. Phil Willen, LA Times. Uh, hi, Governor. Um, one thing I just want to clarify, the, the announcement you made today about uh, the, the diagnostic testing, that's separate than uh, actually testing kits, is that correct? And I guess my question would be, Will the state have, I guess, upward of a quarter million, or the capacity of a quarter million testing kits per day uh, that can get processed, uh, number one. Number two is given um, some of the uh, events today in the state legislature with some positive COVID tests, I'm just curious if you have been tested or members of your family have been tested uh, as well as your senior staff. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can't speak to the contemporary nature of tests, but after, as you know, I, I visited um, um, prisons and uh, felt it was appropriate uh, in the environment that we're in to get tested. I was tested, tested negative. That was a number of weeks back, candidly, and I hesitated, uh, full disclosure. Um, I was rather consistent sharing this publicly to get tested until I felt everybody uh, that needed a test was getting access to the test. I didn't want to put myself in front of the line for many, many months, so I delayed that until a uh, visit into prison where I felt it was appropriate around that time to do so. Uh, accordingly, uh, my family was tested in that capacity as well. Uh, as it relates to the issue of the supply chain, all the reagents, all the fundamental ingredients, and again, there's 20 component parts in these PCR tests um, that uh, required our part and parcel of this contract. And the reason we chose this particular uh, company, uh, not only is it a public company, not only have been partnered with this company for over three decades, not only is it very familiar with every parent out there uh, that has one of those genetic tests that are mandated in the state of California for every newborn, uh, we kicked the tires, all these other companies, and many of them had a lot of the components, but not all of the component parts to get us to where we are, save the logistics, the third-party billing, which is our responsibility, uh, and uh, some of the swabs and the, the viral transport media. We currently have 13.8 million in our inventory. You can take a look at our, um, our dashboard that we put out on the covid19.ca.gov website. You'll see that 13.8 million on that dashboard, and that's our current inventory. We're getting millions a month more new swabs and viral transport media. That will be on us to procure, and uh, we have all the confidence, our capacity to do that uh, as we are moving forward much more aggressively and much more effectively in that space and have already stockpiled millions and millions uh, of swabs um, and the viral media for transport. 
Alexei Kosev, SF Chronicle. Hi, Governor. Um, you mentioned this uh, would be driving down the cost of testing. Is that because you have locked in this uh, processing price that you mentioned through the contract, or are you expecting federal aid that would further offset other costs that the state is expected to pay? Can you clarify a little bit more about how this is driving down the cost of, of the testing? It's just using your market power, using your purchasing power, using business-like approach to leverage uh, that marketing power uh, to drive down costs in a more effective and efficient manner. And so we negotiated, negotiated. Uh, we had conversations with many, many different providers, but we negotiated best price here uh, and best na or favored nation status if indeed this contractor negotiates with another group uh, even lower prices that will get that same matched lower price. But this is a volume discount is the best way I could describe it uh, based upon expectations in terms of total number of tests conducted. The more tests, and let me go to this slide, the new cost breakdown slide, you'll see a slide. The more tests, lower the price. Less tests, a little bit higher price. But again, the price up to 40,000 tests is, again, a third of the lower end average cost of current tests. Uh, so it's a substantial discount. And that will create uh, savings for employers, for plans, uh, for our Medi-Cal system, for, as we're all taxpayers, for Medicare uh, in terms of costs. So we think it's going to create a, a pricing uh, um, uh, and it will have pricing impact that will transcend not only in this context but have impact more broadly to the testing market because the, style, the, the scale and scope of California. So I, I don't want to overstate things because when one does that they usually get burned but I don't want to understate the significance of our capacity to drive down costs and the significance of the cost of testing. Again, it's jaw-dropping. We've done 10.83 uh, million tests in the state of California, averaging $150 to $200. Literally, as I said, do the math on that. The costs are jaw-dropping, and they're simply not sustainable. Uh, as we move into the prospect of a, se a second wave uh, and the likelihood in the spring of next year, even if there's promising therapeutics and even if we see some immunization takes shape, uh, that the distribution, the manufacturing, uh, the supply chain to get these uh, immunizations out at the scale that creates the kind of immunity that we're looking for, that's going to take some time. And, and people start testing again across the state. You saw this a few weeks ago when you started to see the flare-ups in Florida and Nevada. And now you're seeing it in Iowa. You saw it, obviously, in Texas, Georgia, Louisiana, elsewhere. Uh, you saw then more people testing in those states finally and putting pressure where we had those big delays in getting test results back. It's just not, we can't, we can't be victims of that inevitable fate. It's likely to happen again during flu season. We just don't want to be back in that place. And that's why we want to control our own fate, move the markets, reduce, create some more competition uh, in terms of costs, ultimately bring down the cost for everybody. Um, and we think this will improve innovation uh, as well as part of the larger thrust. Alex Michelson, Fox 11. Hi, Governor. Uh, since nobody has asked this yet, I will jump on the grenade on behalf of everybody. You don't uh, have to. You don't have to. I'm curious uh, if you are watching the RNC and if you had a response to your ex-wife who said in prime time the other night that California is a land of discarded heroin needles in parks, riots in streets, and blackouts in homes. Um, this may leave you wanting, but let me first acknowledge that I appreciate you saying landing yourself on the grenade. Uh, and let me just extend appreciation for your effort to get my response and I respectfully uh, defer to the next question. Rachel Bluth, Kaiser Health News. Uh, thanks, Governor. Um, uh, uh, the, the legislature is uh, considering, uh, obviously, a, a bunch of bills to be in session right now. Bills on PPE and contact tracing have languished or died altogether. What would you like to see from them to get 
get to your desk to deal with the, the pandemic in the next few days? Oh, we've been working. Look, at, we've got hundreds of bills. We're currently in discussions and negotiation with, with the legislature on an hourly basis, not just a daily basis. Uh, the prospects uh, of success with amendments, the prospect of failure uh, with the bills presents themselves. I'm not going to get in uh, to the details of that. It wouldn't be prudent at this stage. There's so much that's happening in real time. Uh, but we are advancing a collective cause, one that unites all of us across the spectrum, across both houses of the legislature, uh, and that is to make sure that we're pre more prepared going into the future, uh, make sure that we replenish, not just replenish our stocks, that we set a new bar, a new standard in terms of where we are, in terms of our preparedness going forward. We're trying to find out where we land, what's the appropriate level, uh, where we don't overly indulge. A lot of these are perishable. A lot of these have uh, uh, end dates. Uh, we have to look at what's feasible, what's manageable, what's appropriate. And so that's the test to which we're engaged, test to which uh, we continue to dialogue. And uh, progress is being made uh, in many instances. There are a number of different bills, as you noted, just on PPE. There's a number of bills uh, more broadly across the spectrum related to this pandemic. And we continue to uh, make progress in those conversations. Sophia Bolag, SACB. Um, I'm hoping to get a little bit more clarity on, on the cost here for this uh, contract or series of contracts. So the, the current average cost that you mentioned, that $150 to $200 per test, as I understand it, that includes not only just like the lab costs, but also the cost for personnel who are conducting the test, you know, running the testing site, providing PPE for those people who are conducting the test. So can you explain, does this contract cover all of those costs? And, you know, is that how you're able to get a number that is comparable to that current, um, you know, overall cost that you mentioned? Yeah. Um, and can you also explain, it sounded like you might have been saying that uh, this will lower costs for health plans. How does that work if this is a contract between a, a company and the state? Perfect. Uh, so I have Dr. Galley is already out of his seat moving in this direction uh, and could talk to you about how we're responsible for logistics, which means transporting the tests, how we're responsible for building out the lab site uh, and how uh, we have assumed those costs and how we will get those costs reimbursed through these contracts and what the assumed costs are specific to the cost breakdown that I provided for this uh, new contract. He'll break those down and then he'll more broadly describe uh, who currently is paying uh, for tests and why we believe this will lower the cost for employers, uh, for the state, and for the plans. Thank you, Governor, and thanks for the question. Um, indeed, the, the cost that the Governor mentioned today, uh, what that captures is the entirety of the costs of running the test. So when a specimen that's been collected in the community, so in a clinic, at a mobile site, at one of the, the, the drive-through sites, let's say in a school one day, or at a farm or another factory, uh, once that specimen is collected, it goes to a lab for processing. And as soon as it hits the front door of that lab, the costs to get it processed and to get that result to our public health departments, to the patient person themselves, to the clinician who might have ordered the test, that's what's included in this price. So that includes the test kits, as we've talked about, reagents, all of the instruments that are required, the staffing, which is a very integral, important part of processing these tests, as well as the PPE for those staff to be able to uh, run the test effectively. So all of that is what's included in this price. There are some other components, as the governor described. Uh, there is the entirety of the specimen collection. So the responsibility that we've taken to partner with partners across the entire state to get uh, <coughs> swabs, out to those test collection sites. In some cases, as we have with the OptumServe and Verily sites, and many, many other sites where tests are collected, setting up those collection sites, working with partners across the state to get those set up, but really getting those swabs in the right quantity and number so they're not a rate limiting step is one of the important factors that we continue to work on. 
and get out there. The governor mentioned the number of swabs and transport media that we currently have and increasing that over time. There's the entirety of moving the specimens to the lab location so they can be processed. That logistics contract is another part of it. And then on the back end, that uh, ability to bill our insurers. This is a price that California has locked in for California, but we have planned to extend that. Um, these these uh, lower uh, costs that will be reimbursed at a much lower rate compared to some of the other uh, test reimbursement rates that the governor mentioned earlier. So together, this creates not just an opportunity to increase our testing volume, not just an opportunity to get the per cost test down for all Californians, but we think really to give us, and emphasizing a point the governor made, the ability to deal with the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities that haven't had as much access to testing, maybe don't, can't take the day off of work, so really need the testing site to come to their workplace to get tested. All of these opportunities are opened up in a way that they weren't before. So really leading with this equity principle, looking at testing as an important tool to address disproportionate impacts among population, focusing on the volume, as the governor said, knowing that we have faced before the dependence on other uh, the level of testing in other states to deliver our own testing. This creates a degree of testing independence that we haven't enjoyed till now. And then, of course, the cost piece, which is wrapped up in the original part of your question on what drives these costs. So, uh, you know, we'll be talking about this for days and weeks to come, partnering with many Californians to get this to help us move, not just schools, not just businesses, but really to create a level of insight into how the transmission of COVID-19 is moving in our state, allowing us to address some of the uh, contact tracing uh, opportunities to really reduce and tampen down uh, transmission in places where we're seeing hotspots today and hopefully no more of those tomorrow. Thank you, Doctor. And look, the bottom line is, um, and you've seen that in some of the incredible quarterly profits, some of these labs, I mean, it is, we're well past the point uh, where we need to call the question uh, and we need to do something to lower the costs uh, to taxpayers, uh, to employers, uh, to others uh, in this space. And that's exactly what the state of California is doing. Stephanie Sierra, ABC7. Hi, Governor. The CDC is now saying there is no need to test even if you've been in contact with someone infected with COVID-19. And we've heard Governor Cuomo criticize this change as part of President Trump's policy of denying the problem and wanting fewer people to take the test. So my questions are, do you agree with that? And what's your response to this recent change in guidance? Well, I don't agree with the new CDC guidance, period, full stop. And it's not the policy in the state of California. We will not be influenced by that change. Uh, we're influenced uh, by uh, those that uh, are experts in the field that feel very differently. Uh, and so with respect to the CDC, no, that is not the policy uh, guideline that we will embrace or adopt here in the state of California. Spencer Custodio, Voice of Orange County. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, in Orange County, there's at least five state testing sites, and you know you had earlier mentioned that there's an average delay in tests from five to seven days. Is there any concern on your, by you or um, you know Dr. Galley, that maybe that has artificially lowered the cases per 100,000 residents and maybe moved the county off the watch list a little sooner than it might have should have been? Yeah, let me. I want to be careful in the response. Uh, let me ask Dr. Galley to come back up, and he can talk uh, more learnedly uh, about what that delay may or may not have done as it relates to the monitoring list, the watch list, and where particularly Orange County has been uh, in that space. Uh, thanks again, Governor. Indeed, Orange County, all of the counties across the state have experienced delays in not just collecting tests, but getting those tests processed. Sometimes you'll get the test back in 24 hours or less, especially those who are quite ill with symptoms. We want to know right away. And that's still achievable. But when we were ex uh, experiencing the longest turnaround time issues, we were seeing some tests returning 
uh, two and a half, three weeks after they were collected. And indeed, not only is that really not a useful result to the person who was tested, to those doing contact tracing, but it does make uh, tracking the data difficult. We have worked over the past many weeks to uh, not just improve our ability to understand the data that's coming to us, but really assign the test to the dates that it was collected, understanding when it's reported, and building our models around all of our calculations, whether it's test positivity, case rates per 100,000, around that detail. So, you know, within, uh, within a great deal of contact with the counties, including Orange County, these conversations have given us a degree of confidence that the way we're reporting and working with uh, counties is appropriate. Uh, again, we do uh, always have an open door to hearing about uh, different approaches, and we hear from our counties quite often about different ways to look at these numbers and the data. And when we uh, uh, continue to, to learn and evolve in that space, we share that with you and adjust, adjust our, our way of uh, doing the calculations. But in our current approach, we feel confident that we're doing it in a tried and true way and that counties that are on the monitoring list are there because we've reviewed their data and those who come off are there for the same reason of review. Next question. Adam Beam, Associated Press. Hi, Governor. Um, the news release says that um, the state will be standing up a, a laboratory facility to process these tests. Does that mean the state's going to be building a massive lab as part of this contract? And, and secondly, how, how do you think that all these new tests will impact tracing? I mean, I'm not sure how it's working now. I mean, how, do you think we have enough to make it work with uh, two and a half times as many tests? Yeah, we'll substantially advance those efforts. I'll have Dr. Galley come up uh, in a moment and talk a little bit more specifically about how we believe this will substantially impact our ability in real time to do contact tracing and make it more meaningful because of the diagnostic time and the results will allow us more capacity from an epidemiological perspective to mitigate the transmission of disease and identify cohorts that may have been exposed to someone that has tested positive. will help advance our efforts in schools, uh, help advance our efforts uh, more broadly across the spectrum from hospitals to skilled nursing facilities, including uh, in private sector, sector by sector, industry by industry. Specifically, though, let me uh, take the first part of your question, uh, and that is, yes, we will be building out, and that's the eight to ten week uh, process. Uh, we'll be building out that site uh, using the state capacity uh, to move quickly, to move efficiently, uh, and to build out. We've identified uh, a specific site to develop this lab. Uh, we have the people, we have the expertise, uh, we have the specs, uh, and we'll be moving forward very, very quickly. And that's why we were very uh, eager to make public uh, this proposal and this announcement uh, so that we can move forward to do just that. And again, very gratified by support of key members of the California legislature. Specifically, uh, as it relates to that second part of your question, Dr. Galley can amplify a little bit more. Yeah, uh, thanks again. The governor's uh, right, right on with the contact tracing approach. The availability of turnaround times of 24, 48 hours, our goal is to get it down to 24 hours, means that results get in the hands of counties, people doing disease investigation and contact tracing more quickly so that it's more meaningful. They can uh, reach out to those who are positive, identify their contacts, and get, catch, catch them at the point when they might be uh, most infective to those that they're around. So we believe that this ability to identify cases uh, earlier, quick, more quickly throughout the state will actually enhance our ability to put contact tracing, uh, make it a more effective tool than it has been, especially in those weeks and days when we were experiencing very long turnaround times. And by the time you got the result, somebody's already run through at least one full incubation period and having them isolate at that point or reaching out to their contacts may not be as high yield as it would be to reduce uh, infections uh, that come out of that initial case. Final question, David, ba David Baker, Bloomberg News. 
Yes, Governor, I wanted to ask um, essentially two natural disaster related questions. One, you touched on it earlier. Do you indeed blame this current fire siege on global warming? And then two, thinking of a natural disaster half the country away, I know we did have some mutual aid people coming in to help us from Texas, and I'm not sure about Louisiana, but there's a good chance a lot of first responders are going to be pulled to the center of the country to respond to Hurricane Laura over the next 24 or 48 hours. Are we going to lose people um, to that effort? And if so, do we have a plan for replacing them? Yeah, we've, we've been, we have, Texas has provided mutual aid support. Louisiana has not. Um, we believe under the circumstances we were tracking, um, Governor Abbott certainly has been tracking very closely the prospects, the impact of this hurricane, uh, and the benefit, again, of a hurricane is uh, through the capacity, uh, incredible capacity of NOAA and others uh, to predict with a little bit more uh, certainty uh, when uh, the impacts will begin to occur. Uh, they assessed that. They made a determination of what assets they felt uh, they can provide the state, and he, under that circumstance, and we went back and forth, um, he felt that those assets were appropriate in terms of his total needs. Uh, obviously, if the governor needs to take back uh, those assets, we'll provide them uh, immediately. And the good news is, uh, as an example specific to your question, uh, just today we got a word back from Washington State. They're providing even more resources that would more than make up for any diminution of resources uh, coming from Texas in particular. All the other states that have provided assets uh, we don't think will have any direct impact uh, from the hurricane. So again, it's part of a broader mutual aid system. Uh, I noted last week when I talked about the mutual aid system uh, on the West Coast that many other states were also experiencing wildfires, and so there were constraints already in this space. But 90, uh, 91 um, uh, uh, is the current uh, cohort of engines that have come into the state of California. Uh, and we look forward uh, to getting even more support from those states that have already provided it. And we also, as you know, uh, have support coming from overseas. Um, we'll be making potentially some announcements tomorrow or the next day uh, on a number of other countries that have expressed interest in supporting us and you know, providing resources in real time. So that's, that's, that's on the issue of mutual aid. And the issue uh, of blame, I don't cast or assign any blame. Each and every one of these fires is investigated. We have protocols and after action reports reports are provided in each and every instant. We have an incident command uh, strategy that requires a real adjudication of the facts on the ground. Um, let me just say this, uh, for any of us to assert uh, that they know exactly the cause of each and every fire, um, I think that is very misleading at this stage. Uh, one thing we do know, however, is we dealt with an unprecedented number of lightning strikes, some 14,000. What we do know is we dealt with unprecedented weather, uh, heat dome on the west coast of the United States. What we do know is we had 130 degree weather here in the state of California, which arguably, if it's not a world record, it's very close to being a world record, uh, the hottest recorded temperature uh, in modern world history. Uh, we do know that an impact uh, in terms of our capacity uh, to even provide uh, the energy needs, uh, not only here in the state, but put pressure even outside the state. Uh, so that is uh, somewhat anomalous. It's anomalous in the context of what uh, we grew up with. Decades ago, uh, we experienced anomalies, but not as often as we now are experiencing. They're almost becoming exceptions, more like the rule. And as a consequence, it begs the question, is what the scientists have been saying, 98 plus, 99 percent of them, for decades uh, taking shape? Uh, is it in fact true that they no longer have asserted a point of view? They've proven their point of view. I would argue uh, they have proven their point of view, where the hots simply are getting hot, hotter. That's demonstrable. That's evidence-based, uh, where the heat is such that we have fires, the likes of which we have never experienced in our lifetime. And that's also demonstrable in terms of the total number of acres burned uh, this year in contrast and comparison to previous years. And in the fact that we've had some of the most ferocious and damaging wildfires in modern recorded history. I'm not naive, not naive about forestry practices over the course of the last hundred years. I'm not naive uh, about the impact of structures and the acuity of consciousness around these fires as a consequence of the structure and lives uh, that are impacted by these fires. All of those things have to be considered as well, but I am not in denial 
about climate change. As I said the other day, Mother Nature has joined the conversation. Uh, it is overwhelming, the evidence. If you don't believe in climate change, I'll repeat, uh, please come to the state of California uh, and we will re-educate you or ultimately enlighten you uh, as to the consequences of the earth and its temperatures increasing and the consequences that are having in terms of droughts, not just wildfires, as well as floods and as well as our seasons, as we've come to know them, uh, that are substantially being impacted. Shoulder seasons, wet's getting wetter, uh, not just the hot's getting hotter, snowpack impacts and the like. I can go on, but I've taken enough of your time. I want to just thank everybody for your time uh, and let you know uh, that it is about uh, time uh, for us to now move into a new phase. Uh, we look forward on Friday uh, to illuminating you on what that phase will look like when we begin to move forward uh, with some modified reopening in a much more um, uh, well, prescribed way than we've seen in the past, uh, in a different way than you've seen in the past, uh, with timelines, scope, uh, and expectations that will be set uh, with, we hope, some real clarity uh, and conviction as we announce those protocols on Friday, announce new PSAs, uh, announce a series of other steps uh, and points of contact and access to information, new website, uh, all again on Friday. I want to continue to remind everybody importance of being vigilant, not only in terms of listening to those experts. If you're being told to evacuate, uh, take seriously those evacuation orders. Everybody continue to recognize that we need to reconcile the fact the pandemic is still among us uh, and transmission rates are still growing in the state. It's nice to see that growth rate begin to decline, but growth nonetheless uh, in terms of positive cases coming in every single day, death numbers that continue to be too high, mortality, morbidity rates uh, that continue uh, to sober uh, the senses and require us to take uh, action nothing more impactful than wearing a face covering. Thank you. Look forward to catching up on Friday.